What's up, everybody? This is Dr. Zach Baker of R2P and R2P Academy, and you are listening to the Strength in Knowledge podcast. And today we have on with us a guest, James Chung, who is somebody that uh, I interacted with in the online space and was fortunate enough to be able to get him onto the podcast. Uh, He's done some really cool things uh, early on within his career, and I think he has some experiences and some perspectives that uh, the people who are listening would really appreciate. So James, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, I know you and I had a little bit trouble linking up uh, for a couple weeks. I appreciate the flexibility on your end. Yeah, no, it's a, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I've been looking forward to chatting and obviously being a clinician and coach. Uh, I'm familiar with your work and everything you're doing along with your sports residency program. So uh, yeah, I'm excited to just share a bit about myself and, uh, and chat. Awesome. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, For the listeners, do you mind giving them a background of uh, who you are and where you're at currently within your career and kind of what got you there? Uh, Yeah. So currently I'm a sports physical therapist. I'm based out of New York City and I I was born and raised here in New York City and went to my, or I completed my undergrad degree in psychology in St. Francis College, where I actually played Division one tennis. And I bring that up to start because that's where I started my strength conditioning journey. So I was involved in collegiate strength conditioning while I was playing as a tennis athlete. And that's, you know, I like to say that's the foundation of what I do now as a clinician. And I always refer back to my SNC roots. But I, uh, I graduated from St. Francis. And then I went on to go to physical therapy school at Columbia University. So here, still in New York City. And uh, yeah, so currently working in outer network cash-based clinic in the city located in Alita. It's called Motive NY, where I currently treat right now a lot of runners, endurance athletes, a lot of ultra marathon a- athletes. And uh, it's kind of, it's funny that I'm working with runners because although I was part of Columbia's run lab, where we did a lot of running analysis with, with patients, I you know, didn't see myself working with this patient population because I, I have a a strong attachment to weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting specifically, because I competed shortly after graduating from college. And I always thought myself as uh, a clinician who was going to be working with strength athletes. But to be honest, one of the things I'm having the most fun with is bringing my background and strength to this patient population. And uh, luckily, I'm in a space where I can really uh, leverage my time with them because it's one-on-one for the hour. So it's been pretty good. I graduated in 2022. And so far, uh, you know, taking it day by day. No, that's awesome. And I think it's kind of funny, you know, you're early in your career, you've been practicing for a couple of years, and you're already getting into something that you didn't envision yourself spending as much time in with the endurance athletes. And I think it highlights just the importance of, we don't really know what we truly like or dislike until you start spending some time doing it. And I think I've been practicing for uh, 12 years now, I've gone through a few different things just in regards to professional interest of where I found myself spending more or less time, uh, either in the continuing education space of different uh, theories or models or systems and processes that I thought were more or less beneficial. Uh, and then I've also found myself evolve personally. You know, I'm married, I have three kids, I've got a much different uh, home life dynamic now than I did when I graduated. So, there's certain things clinically, uh, just from an, an X's and O's of patient care that I've seen evolve. And then there's certain things professionally and personally of just what I value now uh, in regards to how I structure my days, how I structure my weeks, the work setting of mm-hmm. what's ideal. So it's pretty cool to hear that you're already, you know, kind of dabbling within that within the first couple of years. But going back into uh, kind of the, the PT space and really the clinical space, what would you say is truly your passion or where have you spent the most uh, kind of either time or just mental bandwidth getting involved with the X's and O's of PT? And, uh, you know, how, how did you run into that or how have you developed that? Yeah, I mean, I've always had an interest in communication and in learning in general. So just uh, pedagogy and just I was actually originally going to be a physical education teacher, you know, and I, I went to a public high school here in New York City. And to be honest, in terms of what I thought was like the end goal for me at the time, uh, in terms of what I envisioned myself doing, was going to college and becoming a phys ed teacher because some of my physical education teachers throughout my youth, uh, you know, really made a lasting impact on my 
engagement with physical fitness um, and also their ability to help me have fun while learning at the same time. And I was, I've always been a big uh, proponent of like of education as a whole. And I, I think that's why I really pursued higher education, going to physical therapy school. And in terms of like going to college, I initially started um, my career path as an educator, but then I quickly pivoted to kind of shooting for physical therapy. Once I realized that there was something above, you know, I, I figured I wanted to do something a little bit more and I wanted to blend what I was doing athletically with my interest in training. And I thought that uh, it just better suited my, what, you know, my preferences and what I wanted to do at the time. And so, you know, I, I'm really big on education. And as when I started as a physical therapist, and honestly, matter of fact, when I started personal training, I was personal training for a while, maybe for like about six or seven years prior to going to PT school. And when I found the most success as a coach or and as a trainer, those moments really had a lot to do with how I was able to communicate with my clients and how I was able to help them better understand their goals, put together a plan for them to achieve them. And also finding this balance of collaboration between the two of us. And I think it's something that I've really taken with me and everything I do now as a clinician. And obviously, if anything, it's even more important, given that now I'm a health- healthcare provider. It's something that I really pride myself in. And that ultimately led me to explore, I'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into motor learning. And I've done a couple of talks about this and it's something I was very, very interested in, even while I was in PT school. And just, you know, I remember listening to the Perception Action podcast with Rob Gray. So if anybody's interested in learning more about ecological dynamics or motor learning theory, uh, something I'll never forget hearing was you can't teach somebody how to move if you don't know how they learn to move. And I really appreciated that perspective because it really highlighted some of the frustrations I had with myself whenever I was trying to learn a skill. I played uh, basketball in college. I played collegiate tennis. And whenever I was trying to learn and engage with a new skill I wanted to get better at, I usually had a hard time whenever a coach would try and tell me how to move. That might be because of my issue with authority in general or as a whole (laughs) potentially, but I feel like that's a different story. But in terms of, you know, what I felt most comfortable doing when I was learning was, you know, finding space and time to learn and explore for myself and coaches and educators in my life that made the, the biggest lasting impact were the ones who gave me that space to explore. And so that's something I've always wanted to continue to emulate with every patient interaction I have and every any client I ever end up working with in the future. I want to make sure I can create that same kind of space and, you know, allowing them to learn more about themselves rather than me trying to dictate how they're supposed to move, which is something I, I have a pretty big issue with in general, with how I initially um, got exposed to exercise prescription as a coach. But I think uh, in hindsight, it, it's something that I'm really glad I came across and really glad I connected the dots with because this really helped me out. No, that's awesome. And it's funny that you had mentioned kind of your entry point into this general field was physical education. And my mom was actually a physical education teacher. She worked with uh, adapted phys ed students and I had always grown up nice. being around it. And I knew I wanted to do something health, wellness, fitness, medical. I just didn't know what. Uh, and then PT ended up being something that I thought checked off a lot of boxes. It allowed me mm-hmm. to dabble in the medical space. It allowed me to dabble in the strength conditioning space. And then the same thing that you just talked about, education. And I think, you know, it's obvious I get the formal education component just from my roles within the residency, uh, overseeing that administratively, doing the lecturing, doing the mentorship for it. But I think we often undervalue the role of education uh, in regards to patient care. And you kind of hit the nail on the Mm -hmm. head. Like it doesn't matter how good of a message you have if the patient doesn't want to hear it, or you're saying it in a manner that the patient cannot comprehend or cannot understand. And I would have to imagine, I'm kind of jealous of your psychology background because I have to imagine that a lot of that stuff uh, that you've learned in undergrad intuitively plays into how you interact, how you communicate, and how you structure a lot of your sessions and, and feedback that you give individuals. Because it's funny, the analogy that, um, uh, that Josh uh, Funk always used that I work with, a lot of times when we're working with a patient, it's almost like we're, we're on different ends of a bridge. And we're both trying mm. to communicate and tell the other person, like, hey, come over to my side, do this. And 
oftentimes it's hard to shout the whole way across over to the bridge and convince them to come over. So sometimes, you know, there's compromise. You got to walk halfway across, get your message, have them meet you halfway. You can have a little bit more mm-hmm. intimate dialogue and then you can figure out which route are we going to go. But it's uh, it's interesting. And I, I'm going to have to check that podcast out because I do think it's funny. We, we try to coach and we try to cue and often I find myself when athletes are having a hard time performing a task, it's very easy to get into this biomechanical model of, oh, they're demonstrating, right. you know, right. they're demonstrating this movement pattern because they lack this mobility, whether it's, uh, you know, joint or capsular or muscle, or they lack this strength or they lack this capacity and they're beginning to fatigue. And that's why they're demonstrating this movement pattern when in reality, Maybe they're moving that way because they didn't even understand the intention of the drill. Maybe you didn't explain it well. Maybe you didn't provide mm-hmm. them with an environment that allows them to demonstrate their physical capabilities in the manner you want them to. So I think, you know, understanding how patients learn, understanding what is influencing their movement. I, I, I love the strength and conditioning aspect of things that I was exercise science undergrad. I was CSCS certified. I did a lot of personal and small group training, and I used to think and function in a vacuum where everything from a movement expression was dictated by range of motion capacity, by strength capacity, by all of those different, you know, quantitative metrics that you can track. And I'm starting to realize as I get deeper and deeper into my career, that's just a a small piece of the pie that we're Mm -hmm. actually dealing with here. So um, going along that, uh, kind of route, what is one thing that you think is going really well within the physical therapy profession? And I know you're, you're earlier in your career, but within your first couple of years actively as a PT, and if you want to kind of reflect back to your time as a student and different clinical rotations that you've seen, or just in the online space, what are some really positive trends that you're starting to see in the physical therapy world? Yeah, and it's funny, on that note of appreciating the complexity, it's not as simple as range of motion strength. That right there, I feel, is improving as a whole. Now, I, I want to preface this by saying, acknowledging physical therapy, there's such a wide breadth of practice. But within my exposure to sports, orthopedics, um, and honestly, I do have some, I was able to specialize in pediatrics while at Columbia, because we, we can, on our, in our last year, we can do a specialty and um, I, I, it actually a lot of what my interests or a lot of my interest in motor learning, you know, is rooted in pediatric physical therapy and care, because when you look at, you know, working with kids, working with youth, babies, you know, and you can't coach them the same way you would coach an adult. And so in terms of being able to get certain outcomes, drive certain uh, adaptations, you have to be able to understand, all right, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? And is the task I'm selecting appropriate for what I'm trying to achieve? And does it meet the individual, the individual's capacities to be able to do that? Is it within their ability to actually perform what you want them to do? And so in terms of what, where I see the profession um, you know, going and what I feel is going very well is I think we're having better conversations around that. And I did a clinical rotation at EXOS and Honestly, if I didn't have this background in motor learning and ecological dynamics, I feel like I would have struggled a little bit more in that professional sports setting. So when I, I spent time in Phoenix, Arizona at Exos, I I really appreciated their um, integration of, you know, that complexity of, you know, taking a systems approach. And I think, you know, ha- having that conversation really allows us to better appreciate the relationship between things that influence movement and the, uh, and the uh, emerges of movement or you can call it that. And it really helps us appreciate the individuality of an athlete or any, any patient that we work with and helps us better understand that, you know, we're not trying to force people into specific box or certain like movement patterns as some people call, right? We're trying to better understand what makes them unique, how we can better leverage their strengths and then how we can collaborate, you know, and approaching it like as a two-way street to make sure we can, again, create that setting for them to thrive. Because ultimately, we can, like you said, we can learn and think, you know, we know how somebody's supposed to move, or we have an idea, um, we have some mechanistic, you know, 
explanation for X, Y, Z. But at the end of the day, like a lot of it doesn't matter if the person in front of you isn't really number one, buying into what you're doing Two isn't really resonating with, you know, or it doesn't have their expectations uh, set appropriately for what they're trying to achieve. Uh, And three, honestly, if they don't just vibe with you, because, you know, as a provider, you have to be able to, you know, have them feel like they can trust you. I think that's going to influence outcomes a lot more. And we know that's going to influence outcomes a lot more, especially if you don't, uh, you know, have a, a positive outlook on what you're doing. And so for me, the profession as a whole, I feel those conversations are happening more often. And I also see it happening a lot more in the coaching world as well, because I still work with a lot of personal trainers here in the city. And I do a lot of continuing education for coaches specifically that want to collaborate with physical therapists. And I'm just really happy to see that because I think we're no longer saying you're in pain because your glutes hurt or, or your glutes are weak. Or your your knee hurts because you a valgus like, and trying to find the answer to you know so-called problems i think we're just appreciating the complexity and i think it's just driving better and better care as we start to really um dive deeper into supporting the individual rather than just focusing on like again like the biomechanical approach that is so prevalent and something that everybody gets exposed to when they first get started but i I definitely see that being a huge shift no that's awesome and i'm talking about the biomechanical approach one of the best uh, PT school experiences I ever had was actually during a prosthetics and orthotics lab and lecture that we were doing. And that was my favorite class, by the way. That's but, awesome. And the individual yeah. who was presenting, it, the, the whole topic was mostly geared towards uh, prosthetics and fitting them mm-hmm. appropriately and gait analysis and understanding if you have an inappropriately fitting prosthetic or orthotic, how could that uh, force certain movement strategies to accommodate whatever mm. the orthotic is. And it, he went into great detail in regards to, you know, if something is too big, if something is too small, if it has uh, all these different variables at play, how that's going to affect the gait cycle. Um, and then he kind of took a whole 180 and he said, all right, now let's take an individual, you know, that they're not somebody who has an amputated limb. They're just a, a, uh, individual who is uh, in the general population and he used a runner in as, a, as an example. And he said, all right, now what I want you to do is I want you to look at this video of this person running and I want you to take note of all of the abnormal gait findings that you have. And then we're going to figure out what we're going to fit this person for. So he plays this video and it's pretty alarming. Every time that this individual's foot is striking the ground, there's so much pronation happening and the foot is going so flat that the medial malleolus is almost touching the ground every single time they're striking. Mm. And that's, you know, you can work that up the chain and you can start to see what other things are happening. And he stops the video and he says, all right, so what do you guys see? And people start shouting out like, oh, there's pronation, there's dynamic knee valgus, there's excessive lateral sway at the trunk and at the hips. And he's like, perfect, perfect, perfect. Now what are we going to do about this? And everybody starts talking about all these different arch supports and wedges and all these different mm-hmm. orthotics they're going to fit him with. And he goes, great, you know what I'm going to do for this person? And we're like, what would you do? And he's like, I'm not going to do anything at all. This is the fastest person in the world right now. He's, <laughs> yeah. in, he's in no pain. He's having no complaints, no issues, and he's highly functioning. So I'm going to take note of it. And if he happens to start having some injuries or happens to start having you know, skin breakdown or something else going on, then we'll cross that bridge. But just remember, you don't need to treat every single thing that you see if it doesn't have any right. performance or health relevance. And that was like mind blowing to me uh, hearing that. And it's something I, I try to keep in mind every day when I'm working with an individual is always just stepping back and figuring out, you know, does this movement or does this uh, biomechanical finding really have any relevance. And it's funny. I, mm. I think back to my days of like early strength and conditioning when I was in undergrad and just out of undergrad in PT school. And y- you know, enough in- information to be dangerous. And I'm taking people through these different warm ups, and uh, I'm in these group training environments and I'll see somebody doing a squat or a lunge and it, it doesn't look perfect. So I stop them, I coach them, I cue them, I correct them and I keep doing this over and over. And it's funny, one of my buddies who's helping me, who's been doing it for longer, he's like, 
Zach, this is just a warm up. Like it doesn't really matter. Yeah, not, yeah. It doesn't matter if they're not squatting perfect. It doesn't matter if their if their lunge doesn't look great. Like the whole purpose that we're doing is to just increase heart rate, increase respiratory rate, get get them warmed up. They're not going to do any physical harm by doing it not in a picture perfect state. And that was another right. kind of like aha moment for me. It's like oh. Does the movement influence the intention of the activity at all? And and if not, then we we can probably put it more in like the yellow flag as opposed to the red flag category with how much we care about Mm -hmm. it. Um, I want to have time for a couple more questions. Um, And I know you're still early on in the career, so there may not be some things that are as evident or some things that maybe they are as evident. You just haven't dealt with them long enough to be really passionate about it. But uh, is there anything that you think we could collectively improve upon within the profession? We just talked about some things that we're doing well. Uh, is there anything that you've noticed that you, you really wish we could kind of go a different direction with it? Or is there anything that you think is uh, kind of a, a big weakness or, or area for improvement in the field? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a couple. I'm not going to talk about the obvious of like, school is expensive and you know we don't get paid as much as we should in terms as providers and i i think that's definitely something that's honestly always going to be an issue and I, the the more that we as professionals like continue to hone our skills and find ways to support patients uh but get paid what we need to i think that's going to be something or an ongoing ongoing conversation but in terms of like looking deeper into the profession and practice i think one thing that personally resonate strongly with is the collaborative piece or the collaborative element uh, with fit, with fitness professionals and personal trainers because I think you know depending on where you are and what kind of access you have to care if we are in a space where we're not able to support somebody or see them as much as we need to we got to think about all right who are the individuals who can support our patients long term when it comes to wellness and obviously, you know, my foundation and my background is in strength conditioning. I was a personal trainer and I'm seeing people two nights a week, three times a week sometimes, right? Once a week in terms of frequency, in terms of being able to execute and support wellness as a whole, uh, I strongly believe personal trainers and fitness professionals are in a better position. But as, you know, I was a coach at the time um, when I really started to think about this because some of the, my most meaningful relationships that also drove a lot of my practice and business when I was a coach was my relationships with physical therapists who also believe the same thing. And so I got a lot of referrals, but at the same time, I like, I like to refer out. I was comfortable referring out when I didn't have the answer to something. And that's when I realized and learned I didn't need to have the answer to everything. And I think that's the issue with a lot of coaches now who don't have that, that bridge or that connection or that network with a provider who also aligns with that. Because when you are in a space where you have a client, they have an issue your profession, your business relies on them con- continuing to see you, but you don't have a network of providers to refer out to. And so you feel like you need to have the answer and you try and solve it for yourself. You can run into issues very quickly as a coach, especially if you're entering territory of like a complex diagnosis um, and, you know, your client hasn't had a physical in like five, six years. This is very normal, although you should be getting doctor's clearance before working with the coach, Right. But, you know, that's the reality of it. You often find coaches who don't have that network support. Uh, and I really wish that it was something that was integrated into the, you know, the spectrum of care. And, and it's integrated into how we think about when it comes to uh, being a healthcare provider. And honestly, it, do, it goes both ways, too, because PTs are notorious for having uh, a bad reputation, not being able to really progress someone or actually being able to train somebody intensely enough to be able to create changes that they say they're trying to make because a lot of PTs who might not, might not have the same background in strength conditioning as I do or yourself as well. So in terms of like, you know, where we can better collaborate, again, I'm speaking to maybe on the orthopedic sports, but I do think there's, there's, and there's opportunity and potential in other aspects of practice and physical therapy, obviously, but I think fitness professionals uh, have a great opportunity to just support and promote wellness and unfortunately, I personally find like the barrier to enter the profession is very low when it comes to being a fitness professional. Uh, but I think the best thing we can do is continue to have educational opportunities, create systems and create opportunities for networking to take place. But also make sure that, you know, we're, we're not 
trying to take clients or patients from each other or just trying to support each other. And I think when I was in school, that was one of my frustrations. You know, I would deliberately pro- uh, probe my professors. Would you ever work with a provider? If you're discussing strength in terms of this being a limiting impairment, how are you supposed to do that if you only see them once a week? And when you can't see them anymore, they run out of visits. How is that something that you're going to be able to promote long term? Would you consider bringing in a coach? And often there was an, a superiority complex I would pick up that really um, I've noticed prevalent across the profession and across providers I've spoken to, especially when I was a coach at the time. So to me, I think we can improve that as a profession. And in general, I think you know, it just has a lot to do with talking with each other more and just figuring out how to support each other. No, I love that. And I think a lot of times we just need to be realistic and, and put our egos aside and appreciate what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses. I think at times we overestimate what we know collectively as a mm. profession. Um, and I think we also underestimate what others know at times. And something that I've tried to be more intentional throughout my career is getting to know the other people in the community. Who are the physicians that are out there? Who are the strength coaches? Who are the chiropractors? Who are the massage therapists? And I think oftentimes people in the fitness world uh, assume that certain PTs don't know anything about strength conditioning. And honestly, in a lot of cases, they're probably right because that's not part of the PT school curriculum. And if you don't uh, have some sort of background or other experiences, you may have a very limited uh, knowledge in that field. But there are some really, really good PTs who are also really, really good at strength. Uh, On the other end of the spectrum, I think sometimes in the clinical space, as PTs, we underestimate how much of what we do in mid and late phase rehab actually overlaps with what just a really good program, uh, a strength training professional can do with an individual. And I think, Mm -hmm. like you had mentioned, whether it's due to insurance limitations or financial limitations, or maybe the patient has all the money and insurance in the world, You have all the knowledge in the world. You just don't work in a clinical environment where you can do that type of training. Maybe you have a small space. Maybe you don't have the equipment or the resources. You need to be able to provide, if you really want to truly keep the patient's best interest in mind, you need to point them in the direction of other people who can give them a very holistic program. And I often found when you get into those later phases of rehab, there's so much that they need to work on it's very, very hard to do all of that in one session on your own. Mm. So if you can build out a team and if you're seeing somebody once a week or twice a week and they're also seeing a strength coach two or three days a week, they can do a lot of just their, you know, their conditioning, building up their capacity, doing a lot of their energy system development. They can do that stuff outside and then you can focus your time introducing new and novel activity, progression into things that they haven't been exposed to yet, And you can really selectively utilize each other's time and resources to your advantage. Um, And my biggest pet peeve is when PTs say, oh, I'm doing power training with this individual. I'm like, really? You just gave them a 15-second rest break? I I don't think they truly are doing power training if they're able to hop right back up and do another 100% max output activity uh, after just casually chatting for 15 seconds. Like if you're doing true Mm -hmm strength training and true power training, uh, unfortunately, just from an energy system standpoint, they need to have legitimate work to rest ratios. And for most PTs, you can't factor that in to the 15, 20, 30 minutes that you have with that individual of one-on-one time. But guess what? You can send them to a strength coach and they can get after it in the weight room and knock all that stuff out there. And you can do maybe the more uh, reintroduction of sports specific tasks and other activities uh, that you want to in the clinic. So I, I think that's a, a huge piece. And like you had mentioned, a lot of it boils down to just be a good person, go out mm-hmm. meet some people, strike up genuine relationships, get to know them, get to know what they enjoy working with, what they have experience in. And you're going to start to realize there is more than enough patients and clientele to keep everybody busy. And exactly. It's, it's funny. There was a business owner in the county that I work in who runs a gym. And he had talked about early on, you know, he used to be afraid of the other gyms from taking his clients and all this. And he's like, you know what? There's 400,000 people that live in this county. 
my gym cannot hold 400,000 people. So there's more than enough people to go around for every gym owner. Uh, and in reality, it's going to be like the, the bottom tier of gyms that kind of cannibalize themselves. It's going to be the mid and the top tier that are all collectively working together with that abundance mindset. Um, right, right. James, we're kind of coming up on the end of this, but um, if you had any advice uh, for people like yourself who are in the early stages of their career, uh, or maybe people who are wrapping up PT school right now, uh, to help them carve out a meaningful and rewarding career, what, what would you say to them? I think some of the most uh, important and meaningful conversations I've had while being a student and since graduating from physical therapy school had a lot to do with the networking I did early, early on in my career. And so I knew that I wanted to connect with people who aligned with some of my ambitions. I wanted to connect with people who knew the stuff I wanted to know and I made an effort back in the day when I was a coach to just send a message. Hey, it's a pleasure to connect. Um, I hope it's cool if I, you know, pick your brain once in a while. But I think people, I feel like have lost the ability to be genuinely interested in others. I feel like aside from, you know, wanting to just seek out information, like you have to genuinely also be interested in who you want to engage with. Because, you know, when somebody reaches out to you and they just want something, you can kind of sense that right away. But I think something I learned very early on when I was networking was to one, do my research, but two, be very genuinely interested in the things that you want to learn and how that individual is involved in those things, because you'd be surprised. They don't probably get as many inquiries as you might think. And so like, if you're that one individual to reach out and show that kind of interest, you know, they're going to remember people, I think generally want to help each other. And I've noticed that in terms of the relationships I've built over the years, because some of the, you know, conversations that I've, I've had in passing have come full circle. Uh, I've, you know, networked with people I, I met for the first time that know somebody I've spoken to maybe four or five years back. And it's constantly still happening as I continue to do this. And so if for any students or even practicing clinicians now, it's not something you can, it's never too late to start. Just figure out who you want to learn from, reach out to them genuinely, like, look into what they do. And uh, for the most part, people want to help. And so, you know, as long as you're genuinely interested and want to know what they do and, you know, what they're doing, where they are, who they're working with, I think it's going to really work out long term. And, uh, you know, don't do it just to get info. Don't do it just to get something for yourself, but offer, you know, how you can support. Uh, I think that's an underappreciated aspect that people for the most part remember the most. And, it, it just comes full circle. It's something I can't really explain in, in too much detail, but when it happens, it's just, you know, I really appreciate the time I spent to really like connect with individuals in the field and outside the field too. I've connected with educators and who knew things about what I was interested in, but I had to fill in this, the blank spaces between what I wanted to do and how I want to integrate that stuff. But that led to very meaningful conversations as well too. So people are going to be interested in what you're interested in too. If you, you know, get the chance to actually speak about it. And so I think in terms of like having a war- rewarding career, I'm still very early on in mine. So uh, I just hope that my network continues to support me. And I'm always looking for ways to support my network as well. And I think that's what is going to drive me forward. And hopefully I can help others along the way as well. Yeah, that is great advice. Well, we've gotten through uh, everything that we had planned out for today. Uh, James, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think all those listening will say the same thing as well. Uh, for those who are listening, you are listening to the Strength and Knowledge Podcast. James, thank you for coming on and appreciate uh, your time and energy today. Thanks for having me.